Hi, I'm Summer May Finlay, I'm a Yorta Yorta woman and we're here with Chief Wilton Littlechild who was a keynote speaker here at the Lowitcher Conference. Thank you very much for this opportunity and honour to join others from around the world to discuss the uh, health and wellness of Indigenous peoples. I come into it from a recent experience in Canada where I was a member of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada which looked into the history of residential schools and the impact residential schools had in our communities. And for uh, six and a half years, we went across Canada listening to survivors of residential schools. We began with 80,000 people that were still alive and it was a court ordered um, truth commission. So it was unique in the world. And one of the uniqueness about our Truth Commission is that for the first time it looks at um, what happens to children when you remove them from their parents and what happens to the parents from whom you've taken the children and the trauma that resulted in that. So we went across the country, listened to survivors tell us their truth. And for me as one who had been uh, in three residential schools in my own lifetime for 14 years, many times I was hearing my own story told in front of me of the abuse that went on in the schools. So going in as a commissioner to work on the truth, I knew the abuse was there. I went through it myself personally, but I didn't really fully understand the depth of abuse that went on in Canada uh, about what adults will do to children. And in this case, uh, the government of Canada had uh, contracted four churches to run these schools. Um, and it was done by law so that parents couldn't really protect their children in a way. So we were all taken to, to the schools. Uh, for many of the children, it was for 10 years out of the time. It was 10 months out of the year. Some children got to go home uh, for holidays. Um, many times I didn't. I couldn't go to, to visit my grandparents who raised me. Um, so it was very emotionally challenging to listen to um, the most horrific stories one can hear about um, physical abuse, mental abuse, and cultural abuse, and some have said spiritual abuse, but worst of all was the sexual abuse, the, um, the horrific stories that I heard about those incidents in the schools and, and the result of that abuse one of the results, of course, is the, uh, the impact on our health, whether it was mental health or physical health or just um, emotional impact of being removed from your parents for all that time. And uh, uh, so we look at uh, those stories, the truth that we've gathered about uh, students' um, experience in the schools right across the country. There were schools right across the country. They were run by mainly four main churches. But the purpose the Prime Minister stated in his apology was to kill the Indian in the child. Yes. Now, how do, you, how do you do that? Well, you punish. We were punished for speaking our language. Um, I sit here with great honor to wear my headdress because these were forbidden when we were children. They were not allowed. Any cultural manifestation was taken away. Your name was taken away from you. It was replaced with a number. So that my name for 11 years was number 65. So when you do that to small children and then uh, challenge their identity in the way that you've taken away their own identity, whether it's um, because of the language or because of the culture, there's serious consequences that happen from that. And it's now playing out in the streets of our cities in Canada, the intergenerational impact. Because we as survivors or abused became, becomes abuser in some instances where uh, we traumatize not only our own family, but our relatives in the community, and it's intergenerational. So yes, this may have happened uh, in a sense long ago because the last schools that were closed in Canada was 1996. So there are survivors that are living with this story today. There are survivors that are living with this impact 
they're homeless, they're on the streets with different kinds of addictions. And these are the health consequences um, uh, that the opportunity for this gathering helps us focus on so that we can not only compare our experiences, because I know that a similar occurrence happened in Australia with the silk stolen generation, but the opportunity we have together is good in a way that we can share this experience with each other, but also uh, work in common to find common solutions going forward. In our case, it was about reconciliation. What do we do with this history that we've learned now? Now that we know what happened uh, in the theme of identity here at this conference, what happens when you attack one's identity? You assault it like we say, uh, assaulting the language, assaulting the family, assaulting the culture, assaulting the community. What happens when you do that through the children? So we come to a point where now that we know the truth, what do we do about reconciliation? How do we make things better? Uh, how do we restore respectful relationships in our communities? So we've come to 94 Calls to Action. We challenge Canada. We challenge the education community. We challenge the justice community. We challenge our own communities. We challenge the political leadership uh, by way of calling them to action. One of the very fundamental things that's important as a conclusion for us is that it's going to take all of us working together. We have to work together going forward on this. So we've come up with 10 principles of reconciliation. Uh, we look at all the 94 calls to action we've made and we say, what are the common threads in these stories that we heard? So what could be an important element for solution? For example, we look at the UN Declaration as a right on the rights of indigenous peoples. Uh, to use that as a framework, after all, it was the longest debated um, UN Declaration in its history. Yeah. And it's a global consensus and it's about indigenous peoples worldwide. So we think that's an important solution to look to. The second principle, for example, as well, is that indigenous peoples have rights, whether it's constitutional rights, whether it's treaty rights, but overall human rights, uh, indigenous rights, that they need to be honored and respected. And we say that they must be looked at from an indigenous perspective. Look at the rights of indigenous peoples from an indigenous perspective how we understand our rights, how our language informs us about those rights, and use that as a solution. We look at traditional knowledge um, and keepers of the sacred stories, our elders. We say that we must use this traditional knowledge, the sacred information that our elders keep as a part of reconciliation. If you want true reconciliation, you must incorporate the oral testimonies our, our, our history together with uh, uh, other indigenous peoples, tribes, or nations, and build on the strength of those rights going forward. We look at um, the impacts of residential school history. What were the most serious impacts on education, on uh, health, on languages and culture, on spirituality, on the children themselves, the murdered missing women, for example, and child welfare as a, as a focus. We look at the impacts of each of those and we say, what can we do about education going forward? What do we need to do about improving health and wellness in Indigenous peoples going forward? And we look at the professional communities like the universities, the governments, the Indigenous peoples, try to find a common solution from all of that that informs what reconciliation needs to look like. So we call on our elders' knowledge. We call on traditional knowledge to be looked at. And we say that culture can now be considered as treatment. So we need to go back to our spirituality. We need to go back to our languages. We need to go back to our, our culture. And that will inform how we go forward in uh, regaining our health, uh, becoming well again. Uh, so we look at those, we look to, um, what can the non-Indigenous community do through the universities or through the, the legal community, through the medical community? And we call on them, for example, to implement the declaration, but also go to the schools. All the schools must now in Canada 
teach this history. It was the saddest, darkest, most unknown about history in Canada because it was kept from Canada. It was kept from Canadians. So now we call on universities to teach this history to um, students in education, uh, lawyers, uh, law faculties, medical faculties. We call on them now, and they're beginning to do it, to teach this history so that it informs reconciliation. So these 10 principles we think are really important in designing a strategy of reconciliation going forward or as a solution to go forward. Fantastic. It's so good to hear you talk about that. Um, is in Australia, we haven't actually recognised our histories. Um, my grandmother grew up on a mission. She wasn't allowed to speak language. Mm -hmm. They were beaten if they spoke language and practiced culture. And so, when, you know, I don't speak language today and I feel like there's a loss because we have mm -hmm. lost so much. Uh, but it's so fantastic to hear that as a country, the whole of Canada has embraced this and that your government, so there is something our government can actually do if they would like to step up and mm -hmm. recognise the previous histories. Yes, it's important for uh, political will to be there and political commitment to be there on both sides, both in the non-Indigenous governments and also with Indigenous governments working together. We have a Prime Minister who actually experienced this himself. He was told in a grade six classroom by a teacher um, that, oh, well, you're not going to be interested in this chapter. It was on history, so we're going to skip it. But he later found out it was the Indigenous what? chapter. Uh, and uh, he was impacted, he was brought to tears when he recalled that experience. So he's made a commitment that for him, from now on, for example, the most important relationship for him is the one with the Indigenous peoples. And he calls on governments to implement a declaration. He calls on governments uh, to ensure that through the ministries of education, that this is taught in schools from kindergarten to post-secondary education, now it has to be taught. So the experience that your mother or your, your grandmother had in terms of being removed from family, like I was, um, we heard many times the reason that we did not teach our children our language, because we didn't want them punished. And so it, this was important for families to know that sometimes the children were upset that their parents didn't teach them the language, but in a way it was to protect them. But at the same time in protecting them, there was a loss. And now we have to do every effort we can to repair that loss. So language and culture are very, very vital to healing uh, going forward. So we have a similar history, Australia and Canada and elsewhere, United States, for example, the Sami people in the Nordic regions of Finland, Norway, Sweden, they're grappling with this uh, together with Russia and whether or not they should hold a truth commission. Um, there's an area here that is interested in perhaps looking at establishing a truth commission because as a model, it's a good model to use to not only resolve conflict, but importantly to restore and repair that historical damage and also to inform us, how do we restore respectful relationships? How do we do that? Well, then we're going to have to look back to culture. We're going to have to look back to language. We're going to have to look back to reuniting family where it's been separated and the consequence of separation within the family. Uh, myself, I come from a family of 12, but I don't know my brothers or sisters except their name because we were all separated growing up. But fortunately for me, I was raised by my grandparents, so I have still... Uh, the language, it wasn't beaten out of me because uh, that's the only language I knew going to school. Um, so I still have my language. I, c I can still do, go to ceremony for, with, for my uh, tribal spiritual ceremony. So I was blessed in that way that I was, uh, it wasn't taken fully from me. But on the other hand, it was the other abuse you know, the physical abuse, the mental abuse, the sexual abuse that I went through. And going through this journey of the commission was a healing experience for me because many times through tears and anger, I was hearing my own story being told in front of me as, a, as an individual. So 
I had to work on my own healing in a, in a spiritual way or a cultural way so that I could survive the commission itself. <laughs> and as difficult as it was, I was blessed to be able to do that. I can imagine it would have had to take a lot of strength to sit there and do that as well. Well, it wasn't only strength, it was sharing the experience with fellow students um, in a sense of crying together or laughing together and recalling good memories we had from school or the fun things we did in school. Uh, we created our own games, for example, in school. A lot of times we, uh, uh, well, we just created games so that in, in, on a playground we would have fun. Uh, for me, it was sports that, that helped me survive the experience. Sports is, um, I'm looking at your medallion here. Mm -hmm. Could you just tell us what that? Um... Well, this is, um, it's beaded, it's traditional. Uh, there's an indigenous person with a bow and arrow, that's archery. But for nearly 40 years, we've been trying to get the indigenous peoples around the world to come together to share traditional games. That's one of the very strong elements of our culture. So we were able to have, for the first time last year, the first World Indigenous Games. So we, we got together and we, we, we tried to uplift the strength of our culture through play and through games and through sports. Um, so we're planning on a second one next year in Canada. Um, because many times people told us that the only reason that they survived this whole history, this experience in residential school, because they were able to play, they were able to participate in sports, they got better meals if they were an athlete, they were okay. able to go off campus or off school to a different school for competition. So it lessened uh, the pain of the abuse in a lot of ways. So it was um, an important method of survival for me to the point where I I gathered individuals to organize the North American Indigenous Games and then the World Games. Um, so this is a reflection on that and how a part of our culture is reflected in our games. Our games have a lot of education included in them. For example, if you take a feather and you uh, throw it so that it'll fly, you have to know how to hold it. And it, it teaches you about aerodynamics, for example, because if you hold the feather in the wrong way, it'll just go, <laughs> it won't fly. But it, if you hold it right and you tell a child, this is how you throw the feather. And the reason being, it'll glide and it'll teach you aerodynamics. There's a lot of education involved in our games. Fantastic. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? Well, the only thing I would like to call on us is to work together as indigenous peoples globally. We have the shared history of oppression, but we have common ability to design solutions together. Um, so every chance that we have an opportunity, for example, here to focus on indigenous health and well-being, I underscore well-being, that's what we need to do continuously together so that not only will the survival and dignity and respect of our peoples happen, but uh, it'll be as Dr. O'Donoghue said, um, for the good tomorrow. Fantastic, thank you so Thank much. Thank you, appreciate it.